Hi, I'm Wendy Fire, one of the rescuers at Black Dreamscape. And today we have with us a very special guest. Um, here today is Maria Hamilton Abugunde, who is a memory keeper and healer. Her writings have been published most recently in the Obsidian, Tupelo Quarterly, Cogzine, and the Massachusetts Review. Commissioned poems appear in the exhibitions B Slash Coming and Keeper of My Mother's Dreams. She's a Kaveh Khanum, Sakatar, Ragdale, and NEH Summer Institute Fellow. She's a faculty member in African American and African Diaspora, um, diaspora Studies and the founding director of the Graduate Mentoring Center at Indiana University Bloomington. Why don't you say hello? Hello, it's so nice to be here. May I say first that I really love your glasses? Why, thank you. I love your glasses <laughs> and your whole outfit, your whole look. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for the invitation and for inviting me. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, this is a segment with, or this is an episode of Black Dream Escapes series, Thought Pathways, um, which is very generously being funded by the Office of Public Art Pittsburgh. So we'd like to thank them for allowing us to have such amazing conversations. Um, <laughs> so here we go. <laughs> so what does rest mean to you? Hmm. Rest means multiple things. It is, of course, the stopping of or cessation of whatever it is that we are doing, but it also means to create a space and a time, very intentionally so, to recuperate. And it does not have to be recuperation from illness. It can simply be to recuperate from your day. It means being able to intentionally set your attention to your breathing and to quiet and to your environment around you to become conscious actually and aware of where you are at any present moment. So in fact, you can rest anywhere, I think, but deep rest really also means taking yourself out of the fray of movement. Awesome. What does your rest practice look like? What does it look like for me? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, for me, it often means um, doing nothing. I said once to somebody when they asked me, what do I do when I get stressed? And I said, nothing. And they're like, well, how do you do that? You can't do that. Nothing. Um, that means actually sit in my garden on the deck and my husband and I, we may look at the dragonflies. We may look at the birds. Yesterday, we spent so much time looking at the birds. Um, it may mean watching a movie, or it may simply mean actually sitting on my cushion or lying in bed and listening to whatever is around me. The key thing for me in those moments, particularly when it needs to be very deep rest, not quite sleeping or um, napping, but just deep rest, it means for me not moving. And it means making comfort for myself um, through teas or aromatherapy, walking in the grass. <laughs> uh, so how does being rested or being unrested influence your writing? That's a good question. So being unrested, um, that I think that depends on what is causing me to have unrest. If it is, for example, the current world situation that we're in where I may not be rested, it may in fact spur me or inspire me to write. Hmm. And so that I'm writing out of the moment. But when I am well rested, um, it gives me an opportunity actually for my brain to be in a very calm place and position so that not only my body is rested, but that my brain and my mind are rested. That gives the opportunity, in fact, for images and thoughts and feelings that I may not have experienced before or considered before because I am writing out of a particular situation. It gives them an opportunity to surface and it gives me an opportunity to reflect on that and to actually depend, determine what kind of language I want to use or allow the moment to, in fact, be 
the inspiration for the language. Okay. Um, so can you tell us what a memory keeper is? So for the work that I do and the work that I'm called to do, um, my body itself, so I want us to think about our bodies in their real, their literal, metaphorical, metaphysical, um, physical, somatic, all of those words, since our bodies are primary archives. Everything that happens to us is stored in our body, on our skin, right? On our bones, on our muscles. You know that the older you get, because if it didn't hurt you before and it happened to you when you were 25, when the time you get to 50, it hurts. So everything is marked on the body. And so my work um, in memory keeping um, and memory sharing is to remember, to access the history and the past that is actually in me. So I do work around ancestral trauma and ancestral healing, which is how I come to, to writing, how I come to doing the healing work that I do and is actually being given access to uh, a past life that's related to the Middle Passage and enslavement, not only in the US, but in Brazil. But it also is through training that I have to help others access memories. It doesn't have to be as vast as say 500 years ago. What it does mean is helping people to access the things that are in their bones and in their bodies and help them to surface it so they can actually deal with it. Right. And because our bodies hold so much. And so, for example, let's take the situation that we're currently in in the world with um, the killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. Um, I anticipate that although we see this now happening, that even a year from now, two years from now, um, people, particularly black people, activists and others, that trauma that we witnessed, we've stored it partly because we've learned how to not express it and the body absorbs it. Um, and I can tell you that after watching the killing of Philando Castile, I watched it two years after it happened, it changed how it is that I even interacted with my body and how I felt. And so the primary purpose is to help people access things that they have been storing or repressing. It doesn't always have to be traumatic because we sometimes put joy aside right, um, to help them bring it to the surface to live with it and to live fully. That's beautiful. Um, so does rest have any roles with being a memory keeper? If so, how does it tie in? Yeah, so you can't do this type of work without your body being in a healthy condition and it becomes necessary even as you're working or between working to in fact this is where the deep rest comes in where the sleeping and the napping not just the cessation of movement but the actual entering into sleep and that time when our bodies and our minds can repair themselves and in fact it's also the time when we may receive information from the ancestors right in our tradition right the ancestors speak to us in many ways but one of the primary ways is through dreams right we can't enter dream states we can't enter waking dream states or visioning states if we are not in fact in a deep place of rest. And so the body itself has to be um, open and ready. Um, the body itself has not to be tight, right? Or clenched um, in order for someone to be able to access the information. And in order for you, in fact, to access the information in a manner that does not um, further traumatize you or make you sick, right? So that, to, so that is really, really important. Um, we are beings of water and light and energy, but we spend so much of our lives like this, right? Like this. And so we can't flow. And what is in our body, all of the toxins that are then get locked in our bodies, in our muscles, um, in our bones, once there is a moment to actually release, right? Guess what? All of those things, like, whoop, 
they now have a moment to like run and to flow. Um, so yes, it has a, a great deal an impact on the ability to access information. Mm. Okay. So here at Black Dreamscape, we always talk about the importance of being connected with your ancestors and the importance of them in your resting. But would you mind speaking more about that in your words as an ancestral priest? So I am um, a member and devotee in the Yoruba tradition. Um, ancestors are one of the very primary places that you begin in this tradition. Um, it was in a moment of rest and deep rest that my mother and my grandmother came to me to provide me with information. And that information later emerged and was reconfirmed when I received a um, higher level or advanced level Reiki initiation. And so the purpose of resting for me um, at whatever level that you are able to do it is to in some ways disarm you from all of the in the chains and the boundaries that we put on ourselves. Even in dancing, if one is rested in a way where you are comfortable, not necessarily the lack of movement, as I said earlier, but where you are comfortable. And today and this week, I've been asking people um, whom I've been leading through meditation is to imagine the backs of your legs, like the skin on the backs of your legs, your back, everything, that your body as you breathe is just pulling you back gently, right? Just inviting you almost into a cloud, right? When we are in that state where we have allowed our minds and our brains to fall away, like all of even the illusions we have, it's a time when the ancestors can enter. And it's a time when we can see perhaps things that we would not normally see. It's almost like a softening of your eyes that when you do that, that you can see things that you would not otherwise see. And that is where you hear the speaking. That is where perhaps you may see or have a vision. The thing after that though, is to trust what you've seen and heard. Right, to trust what you've seen and heard that in this relaxed state, in this restful state, that you are actually able to pass through illusion and pass through the dimensions or the chains or the things that are binding us down. And the ancestors sometimes speak in a whisper. And when you're not listening, they can just bop you over the head. <laughs> 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 you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, yes. So rest is important there as well because you don't want the bopping over the head <laughs> or the pushing out the bed or down, you know, <laughs> to force you to look. <laughs> or the chasing you up the stairs. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so with dealing with the dead trauma and just healing in general, it can take a huge toll on people psychologically and otherwise physically too. Um, how do you usually recover from that? These are such good questions. Thank you so very much. Because anytime that you do an interview and the interviewer has amazing questions, it's also a moment for you to rest and step back to reconsider your practice. Um, mm -hmm. And so... How do I recover from that? Um, one, um, and if I'm doing large work, I don't do it by myself. Mm. That's, that's one thing. And each of us has gifts. So if we're doing big work, um, we each know what it is that we are capable of doing and we do what it is that we're called to do. All right, so that's, that's the first thing so that we are not bearing um, a burden or entering a space of healing or an, a part of the healing for which we are not well suited because that's when your energy is really drawn, right? So, you know, I know that I can't fly, but maybe somebody else can, I'm not, I'm not gonna fly, but you know, 
maybe I do other things. The other thing is in um, in the recovery, one, you have to acknowledge that you need to recover because in doing the kind of work that I do, either um, as healing, whether Reiki or rituals, di different types of rituals that may mean for us to do um, a lot of work in which we're in a different state. Um, when we come out, we have to acknowledge, in fact, that we do need to rest and we do need to recover. So there's usually for the work after the work, there may be a series of rituals or practices or processes that you need to do in order to prepare yourself to rest. And sometimes I have found, particularly if I'm working for a week straight, I've done that for um, at different times in my life, that you're so hyped up, right? That sometimes you have to move the energy out in different ways, but you still have to do the appropriate things for you to clean yourself. That may be a bath. Um, it may be singing. It may, in fact, be dancing. Um, but you, before you go in to do any of the type of work that I do, you must know what your limits are and what are the things that you need, the rituals you need to prepare to go into the work. And then what are the rituals you need to return from the work? Mm. That's extremely important as well as life-saving right? Because too many times in the work that I've done, and particularly working with other healers, that we do the work, do the work, don't take the time to rest, don't take the time to clean, don't take the time to pay attention, and then the healer gets sick. And so all of these things are important in knowing what you need to do before, during, and after. Awesome. <laughs> That's really great. Um, so you say that you're an Orisha devotee. Um, can you tell us what it means to be a devotee and um, if it differs and how it differs from being a priest? Well, it it does. And so I'm a traditional non-traditionalist, let, let's say. Um, I actually have initiations and I just keep it as simple as possible. Um, to being a devotee, it's a, it's a practice for me. Right. So for me, it's been very important in the work that I do, even with all of the initiations I have in the tradition and the work that I am called to do within Orisha tradition and outside of Orisha tradition. Um, with the, being a, a priest, and I do have responsibilities as a priest. Um, so again, I keep it simple. Um, you may come in I, um, as a devotee, as someone who does not necessarily yet have the full commitment to the work. You may be someone, and you may not ever have to have the full commitment. Perhaps you have received your alekes or your colares, as um, they're called in Brazil, right? And But you have made a commitment to be along this path, right? To take certain rights, perhaps, to do certain works, to live your life in a particular way. If you have the responsibilities of a priest, um, as some of us do, not only do you do that work, but maybe you are then responsible to and for other people, right? And that your commitment is more than um, your alekes or how it is that you work with the energies of the orishas, but your commitment is oftentimes a lifelong commitment to the path um, that you selected or was selected for you or divined for you. Um, there are many ways to come to that. And that's not, neither of these things are um, minor responsibilities at all. And neither of them are without great weight, right? And so my responsibilities as a priest may be to care for the people who come to me um, and they also mean that I have a greater responsibility to following the guidelines and the rules that I received in divination. And so there are some differences um, along those paths. You know, as a devotee, you may come in and then it may be divine for you or you may find it's actually not the path for you. It doesn't change the things that you received or even the things that you learned from your Iyas and Babas, but perhaps it's a foundational beginning and then you move on to someplace else to learn something different. 
And whatever it is, it is a practice. It is a day-to-day -day commitment. Um, even if you're not working at your shrines every day, it is a daily commitment to give honor to the creator, to Olodumare, to the ancestors, to the Egun, and to the Orishas, and all of the energies in the world that manifest, um, through which they manifest. Right? It's a devotion and a commitment to valuing and caring for human life and for humanity itself, um, in some cases, depending on your road and your path as a priest. Um, and that's another thing when you come in, you know, you do have a better understanding of what your role is in the world um, and how it is that you are to serve not only um, Oludamare and Egun and Orisha, but humanity itself. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so do the Orisha play any role in your rest? Yes, Orisha and my head Orisha. Um, I'm a daughter of Oshun among daughter of many things, but um, daughter of Oshun, um, um, like work like the like Egun do, like ancestors, they'll bop you over the head too. <laughs> 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 if you're not getting rest. And again, um, de depending on what kind of work I'm doing and what I'm called to do, right, my body must be in a condition to be the conduit. Right? My body must be in a condition to be a conduit. And I sometimes may get rest at my shrines. Hmm. Right? Because we think of uh, when we go to our shrines, perhaps for some people, it's always very active and there's always things to do. But for some of us, that's not always the case. Sometimes it's the place where we go to get rest because it is the moment where we sit with the Orisha and with that energy to listen and to be present and again, commit to the work and the task of what service it is and what path it is um, that we are on. And that's really very important because these are the times where you also listen and where you pay attention and you become aware of what is being said to you. And in those moments of rest, for example, again, body is, is calm, mind and brain are calm. It is also in these moments where you learn to hear and communicate with your Orisha, right? Where you learn to know the voice and the movement and the methods of your Orisha because that is different for each person. Right? No matter if you have the same Orisha, you must learn to listen to how that Orisha and energy speaks to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I'm still trying to learn. <laughs> yes, you're you're green. <laughs> you're still trying to learn that one. Yeah. It's a it's a hard it's a hard task, and it changes over your time, which is why it's so important to sit. And again, the difference is, you know, sometimes it's not always the case, right? Um, between being devotee, learning, and coming in, that the the more you come in and you um, you have been called to that particular path of being a priest, you can be just as deeply committed and doing the work without all of that. I think that is also something that is different across the diaspora, right? Yeah, but it is a, it is a practice. Mm -hmm. We're all, we all have to relearn it and learn it at different times. Yes. <laughs> um, so I know that you learned Brazil for a while. I don't know if you still live there, but um, <laughs> <laughs> what is it like living there? And was resting there any different from resting in the States? Oh my gosh, yes. So only in Brazil for short periods of time, right? Uh, my beloved is from, um, is from Brazil. So I consider it home, even though home is also the Caribbean where I grew up and one of the islands there. Um, what's it like to live in Brazil? I think the first time I got to Brazil, it was for the fellowship, the two-month fellowship at the Sakatar Foundation. Um, I really recommend for every artist in the world that they should find a way to apply to Sakatar. It is 
it's just the most incredible thing ever experience you'll have an opportunity um it's a haven um essentially they covered my round trip travel round trip travel there's no stipend for it um but you have that time just to work on your project whatever that is your project and it's right on the beach and so you walk out of the back door onto the dock and there is the water and so what i found um after i was able to adjust to brazil because it was like a coming home when i first arrived there so it wasn't peaceful it was it was coming home to a place that um was deeply troubled economically racially and in a host of other manners right and once that that settled with me and i realized what was happening um it's the place it's the one place in the the world outside of um, africa where i want to see every state i want to see every country um in africa i want to see every state in in brazil and it was a place that was welcoming so that i didn't feel like it wasn't home because people welcomed me as if i in fact was brazilian um and there are a lot of reasons for that um but when i am there even though i may be working so when i go i'm there long enough not to be a tourist and because family is there it means i wash i clean i cook people are always surprised like you cook yes i know how to cook i know how to clean i know how to do all those things to participate in the community but there is a pace of life for me that i appreciated and that i recognize it's not that there's not things there is always something to do in some cases you have to worry about water you have to um, worry about um, safety i travel with students every other year to another part of brazil so usually i'm in bahia but we go to rio de janeiro much faster paced mm -hmm. right much faster paced but there's still an element to say um where I find there is an appreciation for the appreciation for life and for color and for movement and for sound, right? And that's not to romanticize Brazil because we all know that there are difficulties and, you know, people live, there are difficulties, but there is still, like we go to a place where they play um, samba, there's live samba on Monday nights and to be in a place on a Monday night with community members, we come in on this big bus, but community members, hundreds, and all everybody's doing is just samba. Awesome. Nobody's bothering you, nobody's hassling you, Sometimes they know that you're not from there, so they'll come and they'll teach you a dance and show you and offer something. There's a beauty in that. And I really appreciated that because I found it was the one place where I didn't worry so much. That's great. That's great. Yeah, not there wasn't things to worry about. Just that my body recognizes it as a place that is home. Mm. That was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. <laughs> um, that's all the questions I have. Do you have anything else that you want to add? I don't want to add anything, um, but I do um, want to ask you for my own sake, how do you rest? How do I rest? Yes. Um, resting for me is it's really interesting. Um, <laughs> it's, it's really interesting. I find myself resting is very it's very important to me. Um, it's very important to me because it's good for my health. But then also, um, I have a tendency when I'm when I'm unrested, um, as you say, or as as you said, the ancestors come and and be bopping me. I find myself traveling to different dimensions. Just the other day, I, I've I've been pretty busy and so I was unrested and I was in the kitchen and I found myself in a lush green field with a bow in hand shooting at a wild beast and then I turn around and I'm back in the kitchen um, <laughs> to, to prevent those those things from happening. Um, resting is very important to me. How I rest is um, sometimes it's just laying in bed, reading a book or 
you know, closing my eyes. Um, rest for me, there's so many different ways that I rest. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that I love doing is I love tending to the garden because I view that as a moving meditation. I know that, that you have a wonderful garden. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, working the garden and working with the land is kind of a moving meditation for me. Mm -hmm. um, another way that I love to rest is to just be in nature and listen to, to what it has to tell me. Listen to the whispers of the forest, listen to, to the whispers of the grass, listen to, to what the trees are telling me. Um, listening to, to all of that. Sometimes it's really good to, to rest with my ancestors, going to the shrine, talking to them, just like hanging out with them for a little bit. Sometimes it's good to go and talk with my, my Arisha. Um, I love to, to go and chill under the sea with a lokun a lot of the times. Um, <laughs> that's always um, good for me. Um, other than that, rest is, I don't know, it's something that, that happens daily. Even if I'm very unrested, it happens daily for me because mm -hmm. um, anything can be rest, you know? Yeah. Um, I agree with what you said that a lot of the deep rest, a lot of the deep healing and rest that you, that you have comes from, from, being, from being prone and um, being that way, but rest, for me happens everywhere. You know, I can just take a deep breath and that's good. Or I can just decide to look off into the distance for a little um, and that's a good bit, bit of rest. Sometimes I love to go to to my happy place. My, the, we just talked about that, the, the place. Um, yeah, the place inside of me that, that I, that is calming. <laughs> So that's the highest. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate. I appreciate that. Thank you so very much. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. Well, thank thank you so much for this. We're truly, it's been truly amazing. Uh, we're so lucky here at Black Dream Escape to have you and other amazing people come onto our videos and share their their beautiful their beautiful wonderful powerful thoughts. Um, Yes, <laughs> and share with us how, what pathways their their thoughts go under. The um, the series is called Thought Pathways, and a thought pathway is you know the pathways in which people have different thoughts because you know our minds go in different places, and so this series is just sharing how lots of different people do that. So, I want to thank the Office of Public Arts Pittsburgh again for this because this has just been truly awesome. Um, <laughs> if you want to find more about Abu Gunde or her poetry, there are some links in the show notes below. Um, are there, is there anywhere else that we can find you? Well, usually if you Google me, you can find me or even on my academic website, but I think you have everything that I sent that, um, the people can find and that those links or when they go to them, they'll also include an email address if people do want to contact me um, that way. Um, so yes, but I, I do, I wanna thank you for this work in the world. Um, it is, it should not go unnoticed by anyone that, um, that there are so many people doing it, but most importantly that the, the youth and the, the coming generation is doing this work. And so it, I, I don't want anyone to, to miss that in the most needed, um, yeah, to do this in the world. It's, it's a gift. And so thank you so very much for inviting me to contribute and to have this space and laugh with you. I'm greatly, greatly appreciative. Thank you. Um... If you want to find out more about Black Dream Escape, uh, we have an Instagram, which is Black Dream Escape. We have a Facebook, which is Black Dream Escape. And we have a website, which is Black Dream Escape. Um, 
please subscribe and like this video. Um, it greatly helps us. It, I said greatly, oops. Um, <laughs> it greatly helps us. It greatly helps us so that we can have these wonderful conversations, so that we can, can help people with resting. So um, please consider subscribing to us <laughs> and liking um, and sharing. So thank you so much. I hope you have a restful rest of your day. Bye. Bye.